start first and then I uh, give it to Saima and Hamad. So, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Welcome to the 12th session of HIV awareness, prevention, mm -hmm. and education project in Pakistan, designed and led by Apna Merit HIV Committee. This project aims to reduce HIV stigma, increase HIV awareness, and increase knowledge about the disease among the healthcare providers in Pakistan using educational and research tools. Please note this is an academic volunteer activity and all views expressed in these webinars are speakers' personal views and do not reflect any institution. During this calendar year, our team delivered 11 HIV educational webinars. More than 700 people participated in them and webinar presenting faculty was affiliated with more than 35 institutions from the USA and Pakistan. Based on the information gathered in these 11 webinars, we published a report on World's Day 2021 so this report summarized the pertinent issues raised by the healthcare community and strongly advocates for immediate and urgent attention to address the deadly trajectory of HIV in Pakistan. We are already planning our next year's project. And uh, just in summary, our 2022 project is to help improve service delivery and quality of care provided at ART centers through collaborations and education of everyone involved. So to achieve this purpose, we have invited our panel who are all on front lines of HIV epidemic in Pakistan. Thank you all for joining today and we dedicate this session to World AIDS Day 2021. So let's begin. Our moderator today are Dr. Saima Abbas and Dr. Hamad Ali. Dr. Abbas is an ID doctor, physician working in the USA and is the co-chair of Apna Merit HIV Committee. And Dr. Hamad Ali is a medical epidemi epidemiologist currently working in USA. In 2019, he worked as a part of WHO team that investigated and responded to the HIV outbreak in children in London. So welcome Dr. Abbas and Dr. Hamad Ali. You can start. Thank you so much Fiza for the introduction. Um, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to the Abna Merit final webinar. Um, let me share my screen. Everybody can see? Yes, we can see. Okay, give me one second. Okay, chale. Um, so um, thank you, Fiza, and thank you, everyone else, and thank you, Hamad, for helping me with this moderation as well. And um, I am especially excited today to uh, welcome our esteemed panelists who have um, the privilege of being in a position of power, influence, and authority, and have the funding without which any vision uh, and any conversion of that vision into reality is uh, near impossible. So we are uh, very excited to have our leadership here today. So this is our final webinar, and the title is Vision for HIV in Pakistan for 2022. So um, as Fiza mentioned, this is our six page um, report that we submitted on the World AIDS Day, HIV Awareness Prevention and Education Project in Pakistan, basically summarizing uh, what we did with the previous 11 webinars and what were our findings. And most of the discussion today is based on this. And if you have reviewed it, then uh, most of those same issues will be discussed, inshallah. So in the interim, since we last um, presented that World uh, AIDS Day, this is an interesting document that came uh, to my attention, which I thought was 
again important to share the ground reality as it is today. So apparently this is from the World Health Organization, the Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Infographic Snapshot um, of Pakistan 2021. Now, if you look at these statistics on this side here, um, these are uh, basically based on UNAIDS estimates from 2019. So they're not depictive of today but the most latest statistics that we have. So I'm just going to um, uh, review the, the basic overall numbers. So the total number of new HIV infections is 25,000 uh, as per 2019 UNAIDS estimates. The number of people living with HIV in Pakistan is estimated to be 190,000. And the number of AIDS related deaths is about 6,800. Now from an infectious disease standpoint, if these 190,000 individuals or more that we not know of do not get treatment or are not virologically suppressed, then this is a 100% mortality in a decade or so, unless they die of other causes. So this is an important difference between any other virus that we talk about, that HIV is a slow killer and it will kill 100% of the time untreated, uh, maybe 99.9% .9 of the time untreated um, with HIV AIDS in a decade or so. So we've talked a lot about and heard the slogan of 1990 and a more ambitious slogan of 95, 95, 95 testing and treatment cascade. So this is an important statistic that uh, we need to be aware of as we discuss uh, our um, uh, vision today. So the first um, here column that you see is people living with HIV who know their status in Pakistan. So as you can see, the red circle means that there are major challenges here. An orange circle would mean that challenges remain and a green circle would mean that the targets have been achieved. So this is definitely in the red. So only 12% of people living with HIV are estimated to know their HIV status uh, as far as females and 24% males. What does that mean? What that basically means is that at least 78 to 80% do not even know that they have HIV. The second column is that people living with HIV who know their status, who are on antiretroviral therapy, is only 9% of these people of the 12% and 13% of the 24%. So these are the patients who know they have HIV and they are getting treated for it. Now, the last column, which we do not have any data, that's what the no data ND stands for. So these are people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy who have achieved viral load suppression. So unfortunately, we do not have any reliable and accurate statistics, at least not that uh, have been published as yet. So what is the bottom line as we try to create a vision. So unlike COVID-19, where a vaccine is the most effective prevention, for HIV, treatment is the most effective prevention. So, you know, we are already struggling with social distancing, masking, hand hygiene, and despite all those measures, we still end up with COVID. Um, as far as HIV is concerned, whether it's condoms or abstinence from sex, or reusing needle, uh, monitoring that and preventing that, the bottom line is um, if they can take their medication and they are virologically suppressed, undetectable means untransmissible. So if we don't remember anything from today, the main vision is to test and treat. That, that is really the bottom line. So using the previous slide, these are the key performance indicators which we look at, which are important as the healthcare community to be aware of what are we really trying to do. So if you look at the first indicator, percentage of people newly diagnosed with HIV who know their HIV status is one very important vision that we need to increase our testing and screening. 
The second one is percentage of people living with HIV who know their HIV status, who are on antiretro, antiretroviral treatment. And these are those who are registered at our 49 ART centers. And the third one is the percentage of people living with HIV who are on antiretroviral therapy and are actually virologically suppressed. And the last statistic, which I thought is important, although mortality statistics is difficult in Pakistan, but this is the number of AIDS-related deaths. So this is the last authentic um, document that is uh, part of the HIV um, statistics and an in-depth analysis, which is the integrated biological behavioral surveillance, which was done in 2016 and 2017. And I think this is a quote that I took from there, which will um, be helpful in uh, seeing where we are today, especially with our panelists. So the AIDS response must become substantially stronger, more strategic and better coordinated with accountability and transparency centered to it. It requires a strong national commitment and leadership at both the national, provincial, and sub-provincial levels. In addition, it needs a paradigm shift from an episodic crisis management approach to a long-term strategic response. So we are not here to reinvent the wheel. I think the vision in 2016 remains the same in 2021. So let's begin. I would like to invite our first speaker, which is Dr. Hina Jawed, who's actually in the United Kingdom as of a few hours ago. Um, and she will be helping us identify the knowledge, attitude, and practice gaps. She is actually a family practice physician, um, family medicine at University of Health Sciences in Lahore and has participated in our previous brainstorming session, which was our 10th webinar. So welcome, Hina, and uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, there is a slight change in the program because uh, Dr. Noshin Hamid is here and she, is, uh, uh, she has another engagement as well. So if, we, if I can request a change in plan, Hina, if you don't mind. That's fine. Yeah, please go. Ahmed okay. to go uh, first. Yeah. Okay. Welcome, Dr. Nasheen Ahmed. Okay, let me thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry for dis disrupting your sequence. Uh, actually, it's a Sunday night in uh, Pakistan. And there were some commitments. So if you allow me, I could give my comments. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Thank you very much. So it's a real pleasure to be here amongst you and uh, you have taken up such an important topic, which is very, uh, I think, relevant for Pakistan at the time. So I would like to congratulate the APNA Merit HIV Committee and their collaborators on successfully conducting a year-long campaign on HIV awareness, prevention, and education in Pakistan. The current state of HIV control is worrisome. Pakistan has been registering 20,000 new HIV cases every year for the past few years. Case count among the countries in Pakistan did high risk key populations for more than 30 years. Transmission is no longer confined to the key populations, which is really uh, alarming for us. In the last decade, at least five out of seven outbreaks of HIV in Pakistan have occurred in children, as well as men and women without traditional high-risk behaviors. So general population is getting infected, primarily because of the unregulated use of contaminated needles and syringes and the unscreened blood products. Hemodialysis units may also be contributing to the spread The challenge is the communication. Data collection leaves a lot to be desired and leads to delay in the vital decisions and implementation of the control strategies. Our government is committed to provide better healthcare to the people of Pakistan through regulation of health systems to provide safe services. We have taken the essential first step towards preventing HIV, HPV, and HCV. 
transmission from used syringes. Our government has passed a legislation whereby only auto destruct syringes uh, will be used and they will be available for the medical use. Government is also trying to find ways to reduce our dependence on the foreign funding for control of diseases like TB, HIV, and malaria. One important step in introduction of universal healthcare, where, this, where screening for HIV would be important component and needs to be assured. Government is cognizant of the fact that the marginalized populations may not be getting the care they deserve. We are taking active steps toward facilitating key populations and transgenders and are <clears throat> planning to link them to the Sehat Saulat in Health Insurance Program to provide the stigma-free care. We are grateful to the Global Fund for providing the grants and supporting the infrastructure for the HIV diagnostics and treatment services in Pakistan. We are also grateful to the UNAIDS, UNDP, and WHO for their support. And we really hope that in the coming years, we will have some concrete steps to control the HIV, which I believe is a time bomb which Pakistan is sitting on. Thank you very much. And I will be with you. I will be hearing you. I will, be, I will stay online. And I would like to hear what you people are saying. Thank you very much for giving me the chance. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Noshin Hamid. And thank you so much for being here, despite how busy you are. Uh, and thank you so much for your comments. So, so we appreciate that auto-destruct syringes. That uh, seems a very important step. And I hope that the implementation is um, not uh, a frustrating journey because I, like all policies, uh, this has been an ongoing um, frustration with the healthcare community that policies are made, but somehow there is an issue with implementation and execution. Um, uh, one question I had was, the level of acceptance of HIV in the parliament? Is that something which is still very stigmatized? Uh, yeah, I think in the parliament, uh, in every session, we do have a question raised uh, uh, about HIV, HIV, because uh, <clears throat> obviously that means the members are well aware of this situation, because every session they do uh, talk about HIV, and because we have got a question hour every, in every session, uh, this matter is taken up and they are really interested to know what the government is doing. And the members, uh, even in the standing committees also, and on the floor of the parliament, HIV is being talked about. That means that they are sensitized and they want to do something about it. And they know that uh, obviously they don't consider it as a stigma. They want to know the solutions to it now, what the government is planning. Okay, well, we appreciate uh, your help and you are in a position of power and uh, may Allah help you help uh, all these people who are very helpless. So thank you for your time. I think we'll uh, move on to uh, Hina Javed. Yes, uh, Dr. Hina, please go ahead. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Um, and I'm glad that uh, Madam has provided an outline. Provide kar hai. Uh, Madam, I know you've you've mentioned you've used the word sensitization and stuff, uh, Lekin, I think we, we need to be aware of the fact that denialism uh, occurs at multiple levels. Uh, denialism um, starting from those uh, who have to make decisions, moving on to those who have to treat the patients. Um, I belong to the family medicine fraternity. Uh, pe paucity had training ki jo community based physician hai uski. General practitioners, who are privately based, are unki hai. How confident are we that our physicians sitting in the community are going to identify the high-risk population? And how confident are they in asking the sensitive questions about somebody's lifestyle? It's a sensitive matter. You have to approach it in a particular way. So, kya hamare doctors ki training wahan par hai ya nahi? And are doctors in their comfort zone in bringing these matters up? suspect but And then are there any helplines provided by the government? If suspect so can that be provided to the patient? You can call on this helpline and ask for confidentiality. Kya maintain hogi patient ki? Ye basic questions. Hain. Madam, mental health problem may a condition a depression. Usko hum social taboo le lete hain. 
तो एच एड्स की डायग्नोसिस देना उससे बहुत बड़ा लेवल है सो दीज आर सम ऑफ द क्वेश्चन वी नीड टू स्टार्ट टॉकिंग अबाउट और डॉक्टर्स की अप्रोच भी नॉन जजमेंटल होगी बिकॉज नो बडी इज गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट इट यू फोगेट के पेशेंट आपको कोई भी ऐसी इंफॉर्मेशन शेयर करेगा अपनी लाइफ स्टाइल के बारे में पर्टिकुलरली हाई रिस्क प्रैक्टिस पॉपुलेशन वी नो वॉट दीज आर थ्री आउट ब्रेक्स हुए हैं और उसमें वी नो द टॉप मोस्ट कॉज द एविडेंस एग्जिस्ट इट हैज बीन पब्लिश इन द लिटरेचर Uh, by prominent people and uh, internationally recognized ke reuse of needles and so we know the cause the question is what, what actually are we planning to do about it again we know the hot spots we we know the mechanism how the reuse needle is is used again and go, so on and so forth um and am i right in thinking that denialism is accompanied by lack of empathy again at multiple levels there are there are several layers let's let's accept that there's a problem and let's accept that we have to talk about it um so these are some of the things the core issues which i wanted to just highlight it's believe me it's not easy to have a conversation with the patient about this topic those who are um that's the ground reality basically so i just would like you to just take that message back and and kind of let's have a plan on how we can execute it thank you thank you so much uh, hina i appreciate those uh, I, i always love your feedback <laughs> um one couple things i would like to say is you know we have talked about this in our previous webinars as well is that making uh, hiv a routine test without really going into the sensitive uh, histories is something that we will have to come um, uh, to number one number two another thing is that um, you know the perception of this disease has to be destigmatized because you know you've had a blood transfusion you went to the dentist you went to the barber you know now hiv is spreading so it's spreading through syringes let me just do a routine test not make a big deal of it so these are some of the strategies that we use but you are so right that if there is any hesitancy on the part of healthcare workers of course they are going to hesitate to even ask the question um so let's thank you very much hina i just want to add a quick point here you cannot test a patient without their consent yes if it comes back positive it will have huge implications we have to have these difficult challenging consultations before the blood test what if it comes back positive yes that that um, is the whole thing the relationship so yeah that is true that is true uh, well i guess it's patient to patient based and um that you can you know um uh, gauge but i i guess that is definitely an area of uh, education and training and i also appreciate your point about the helpline i think that that is a great point thank you so much hina thank you um our next um i would like to invite our next speaker dr umair malik he is the hiv treatment specialist working in the PR unit of Global Fund National AIDS Control Program uh, in Islamabad and um, Dr. Mehr some words of wisdom on the topics uh, on the topic today and what is your vision and what are the gaps in achieving that Thank you very much uh, first of all i would like to clarify two small things one that i am working currently in SR unit we are no more PR Uh, the pr is undp maybe dr nashmiya is here so uh, the, the second thing is that you have shared the who slide i think which is very useful uh, but it is not capturing the the viral load suppression in pakistan as the data comes to me and dr bushra knows we have outsourced the viral load to aku so all the pakistanis are eligible to go to any pick up point across pakistan from gb fata ajk so the last i have with me the, the exact data is 66% viral suppression so we are on the track we are struggling very hard uh, but this uh, i i have the uh, evidence of this that the current the last december 2020 uh, i'm expecting it it will be around 75 this year but we are working very hard on this uh, regarding the your question uh, i just want to uh, few points uh, 
um, first of all, I, uh, today I have discussed with my some few outstanding counselors and the case managers in the field. And we have like FGD today, I, I, I asked them to give their feedback and I'm just acknowledging them. Uh, most of the people uh, in the field are saying that the, the stigma is the single most cause of this uh, lack of adherence. Uh, if, uh, because uh, I've already shared with you the, the Dr. Nashmiya, me and Mr. David from US, we have studied that the, 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 pap the, the patient who came to ART center and they are lost within the first visit. So I try to go the deeper and the, the commonest uh, perception from the field is that the stigma of the healthcare providers. This means that our ART centers are not customized to cater the needs of the people living with HIV AIDS and especially the key populations. Uh, so we, we need to look into it. How can we make the conducive environment? Because once the patient is in the clinic, we must work very hard and a counseling should be so. Uh, the second thing is that the, the stigma and the behavior of the society, you know, uh, when somebody declares HIV, if he's on the treatment, he may lose his job. There's the issue of divorce in the family. Uh, these are the issues. And third, uh, the issue which is coming from the field is that the, the cost of the traveling cost, because we have 50 clinics in 33 districts and Pakistan is a huge country. Currently, I have no clinic in whole merged districts of FATA in JB and AJK. So the people from the Gilgit have to come to Islamabad, which is 14 to 18 hours by road. And this is a, 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 it cost them, the travel cost, because this is lifelong treatment. So we need to plan. And I think the Sin government and Punjab government have already planned the next two to three years in every DHQ, at the every district level we have, must have an HIV clinic across Pakistan. Uh, another very interesting finding from the field was that the Aga Khan or uh, the result of viral load, when it says non-detective, uh, the, the patient asked the healthcare providers nearest to their facility, like general physicians, and those who are not sensitized or don't know the viral load, uh, non-detective means uh, what they, they wrongly inform or misinterpretation mis of the report that you are no more HIV positive. So uh, this is very interesting from the, uh, what I found from the field. And the thing is that we have the position of counselors in the field, but we don't have uh, the, the female counselors or male counselors. And our patients are about 70% males. So we need uh, look into our gender and cultural background that maybe a female patient is not comfortable to talk to a male about the sexual rights or a, a male counselor uh, other way around. And the, another thing is that the, we have many overseas clients uh, going working to in Middle East or UK or US. They are registered here, but uh, when they go abroad, uh, the, the system shows them lots to follow. We don't know whether they are getting treatment in Saudi Arabia, in UAE or US or America, but in our record, they are lost to follow. Uh, another uh, reason from the field was that the data is updated by the a data entry operator and like one of the big center in Peshawar have no data entry operator. So there are 600 missing entries. So these patients are not lost to follow, but the record is showing them lost to follow. So another issue is that Punjab is not updating any data since last five years in national MIS. So any patient from Dow Medical College is transferred to Punjab then because Punjab is not uh, updating his data is shown as lost to follow. Actually, the, because they, they, these people, they got jobs, they transferred from one district to another. Anybody is coming from KP, Blochistan, and Sin to Punjab is shown as lost to follow because the Punjab is not updating the MIS. Uh, uh, what is, uh, I think these are the major uh, issues, plus the, uh, the, the mechanism of reporting of death. Many lost to follow are actually dead, but there is no formal mechanism uh, unless and until the relative informs the HIV ERT clinic that the patient has been dead, our records is always referring them that these are lost to follow. I think it is uh, the time is uh, enough for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Omer, for excellent uh, suggestions and from feedback from your uh, social workers. 
uh, I think these uh, sound like some, um, I mean, some data entry issues and some logistics, which uh, I think we can uh, ask our um, coming speakers, but um, uh, excellent um, um, observations, Dr. Omer, thank you. Um, is Dr. Khudadat Khan with us or? I don't see him, no. I don't see him. I don't think so. I saw him for a minute, but uh, I think maybe he's having some Wi-Fi issues. So we can move on. If, if he joins, we can go back to him. Okay. I will hand over to Ume, uh, Dr. Hamad. Thank you, Saima. So since Dr. Khan is actually not on the line with us right now, we will move on to our next panelist, Dr. Faisal Mahmood. Dr. Faisal Mahmood is an associate professor at Al Khan University and is the section head of infectious diseases. He has been working with HIV patients in um, SEND for a very long time. Um, welcome, Faisal. Um, and the question that I have for you is, since you've been working on the front lines for a long time with the patients, what are some of the greatest challenges that you see in patient care specifically, both in public and in the private sector? And what are some of the recommendations that you have to address those challenges? Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. And thank you so much, Apna, for, for inviting me. Um, so I must say that the I, I didn't know the question to begin with, uh, so it's a little bit of a surprise. But but no, I can I, we can answer. So so actually the 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 challenges in the private public um, both sectors um, and a lot of these have already been um, mentioned. Um, and Dr. Mayer very nicely put these uh, uh, together. And some of the the really topical ones are things that we really never expected um, are, for example, the viral load one, which is something which has come up many, many times where people have actually been lost to follow up just because the report says um, viral load not detected. And this is um, something that people have come to us multiple times asking us to fix the report or say not say that the viral load is, is, is undetectable um, somehow. Um, the biggest uh, problem um, actually does depend on which group you're talking about. So if you talk about the IV drug users, um, the biggest issue we have over there is obviously retention and care. Um, uh, this is a very mobile population, uh, a population which is lost to follow very frequently. Um, and also uh, this is a population where we know that a lot of times therapy started, stopped, started, stopped. Um, so uh, And transmission occurs very rapidly, which means that we are potentially sitting on a lot of drug resistant um, um, HIV. And since genotyping or checking of resistance is not part of general care, um, this is sort of a challenge that we uh, we, we really do face. Um, the second issue um, uh, is with the MSMs. So with MSMs, um, you know, uh, for people who may not know, and I think a lot of us know, and MSMs in Pakistan, again, um, are, are a very heterogeneous group. Um, we have um, our MSWs, male sex workers, uh, which are sort of different than uh, the, the other um, MSMs. And a lot of our men who have sex with, with men are actually part of the general population for the most part. They're married, they have children, um, but they also have this other life uh, that they lead at the same time. Um, and what we found in when we when we've looked at centers is that a lot of people when they come in and you look at the mode of transmission, it sort of says unknown um, or not documented. Um, and we've, we're currently sort of going back um, to some of these centers right now currently um, trying to figure out um, is it truly unknown or was this something that you could not uh, the elicit in clinic? Again, something that uh, Dr. Hina had brought up um, when you talking taking history and trying to um, elicit this out. Uh, the stigma um, is, is a big issue, and one problem we have with our HIV care um, in the country is that this is really at HIV care centers. So anybody walking in um, to one of these centers is sort of uh, marked as somebody who has HIV. Um, and this is why sort of a, a, a more combined clinic may, may work better. Um, and uh, for example, this is what we have at AKU. My patients don't know um, who has HIV and who doesn't. And therefore, you know, we have people coming from all over the country just for that one reason um, that people don't know um, that they have HIV. And the last challenge um, uh, that I feel really is uh, is the care provision themselves. So over here, we have a lot of people who've been taking care of HIV for a long time. But, you know, if you go to the HIV centers, the training of the care providers is, is, is minimal, um, sometimes none. Um, the way that they're trained is, is by going to um, sort of shadowing another um, uh, person who's often not an ID physician. 
Um, and this is a job which nobody wants to do. Um, you know, nobody wants to take care of HIV patients. So, so um, you know, you, you you can't really think of HIV as a career path very frequently. Once we had started, uh, we tried to sort of make um, this uh, a course where, you know, you could get a almost like a, a degree in HIV um, and there was just no interest. Nobody wanted to do this um, uh, as 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 a as, as a career, um, it's sort of not a great career. And I think um, I, I just saw Dr. Katie um, Usmani join in, and he left again. And and he's probably uh, been in the field for for very long. And he made he also echoed something similar recently. So so these are some of the challenges that that I've seen. Um, uh, and I'm happy to talk uh, later on. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Vessel. Uh, we will certainly be talking about some of these challenges that you've highlighted with other panelists as well. But it's really um, so the first challenge that you mentioned is really important, just the stigma of going to a clinic that is designated as an HIV clinic, and by proxy, even if you're going with somebody else, if you're taking a patient that you're, you know, um, that is potentially HIV positive, the stigma around that, the fact that you're actually going to the center automatically translates to you having HIV is obviously a big thing that needs to be addressed. Um, but in interest of time, I'll move on to our next speaker, Dr. Ajwal Khan. Um, Dr. Rajwal has worked with the government of Pakistan, with UNICEF and WHO, and is currently working with UNAIDS as the strategic information advisor. Dr. Khan, there has been a lot of discussion in our previous webinars on failures of strategies, potentially because of either weak implementation or because of poor accountability or because of lack of transparency. As the SI advisor, what do you perceive as the most effective strategy to first evaluate the burden of disease in both key populations and general population? And also, what do you recommend as alternate strategies compared to what we have had in Pakistan so far? And no, thank you very much. You have very rightly pointed out that one of the main issues is the implementation of the strategies in real spirit. I think um, the strategies that has been developed at the national level and the provincial level are neither being used to design or the govern, uh, oversee and manage the AIDS control program at both the level, at the provincial level and the national level. Now, I think um, um, we need to look into this, but the serious issues is um, uh, no doubt with the governance and accountability in the system. Now, I think Dr. Nushin Hamid is also on the line and I think um, if some of these issues that the strategies developed by the government are implemented and um, uh, it, um, in the spirit that I think will resolve all the issues because the government is also now quite um, uh, extent uh, realizing that the intervention should be focused and targeted among the population where the highest burden of the disease is. Now, I think uh, the only thing is to push uh, for the implementation of the strategies that are developed uh, through a broader consultative processes. So my next question after that is, as the SI advisor, how confident are you in the data that is currently available to assess the burden of disease? We do have obviously no. a fair bit of data for no. key populations, but what about general population? No, well, with the general population, we cannot say because the only data that is available with us is either from the integrated biological behavior and biological services or extrapolated. Dr. Khan, you're breaking up a little. Dr. Khan, we are unable to hear you if you're speaking. Okay, well, in interest of time, we'll move on to our next panelist and come back to Dr. Khan later if the connectivity improves. So our next speaker is Mr. Salman Qureshi, who is a senior program manager at Nai Zindagi. Nai Zindagi is a nonprofit organization and provides health and social services to individuals yeah. and families affected by drug use and HIV AIDS in Pakistan. Uh, yes. Sorry, Dr. Khan, we actually lost you for a couple of minutes. 
Are, are you yeah. there? Yeah, I am here. Yeah, please. No, I think the last question which I have says that um, uh, uh, we do have the um, uh, data, outdated information, but the uh, next round of the IBBC is planned in early 2022. Now, hopefully with that, we will be having some more information and new data. But the challenge what we have is that the data is not used for the proper planning and decision makings. Over to you, please. Thank you for that. And I actually also, our next speaker were, Dr. were Mr. Salman Qureshi, but I don't think I see him on the call anymore. Yes, Sam I don't see him too. Yeah. So I think we can move on to our next speaker. Sure. Saima, back to you. Thank you, Hamad. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ramesh Kumar. He is currently working with the Common Management Unit for HIV AIDS, TB Malaria, a Global Fund Grant, Ministry of National Health Services Regulations and Coordination. Um, so um, Dr. Kumar, I wanted to know what is the vision of um, the, the Ministry of National Health Services as far as estimating this burden of disease is concerned and how do we plan to improve coordination and reporting of data at the national, provincial and sub-provincial level? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for invitation and thank you very much for arranging this uh, uh, nice forum to share our views uh, regarding the vision of HIV, how we have to manage this HIV uh, issues in Pakistan. Uh, yes, regarding your question, uh, as uh, uh, Madam uh, Noshin Hamad has already mentioned uh, about the vision of Ministry of Health, but I have to uh, add a few things. Uh, these are very important. So let me respond to uh, your first question. Uh, regarding the leadership, yes, uh, we do have big challenge uh, nowadays uh, as we are uh, seriously, you know, uh, facing this uh, bigger problem uh, regarding, you know, IBBS data. If you see the number of uh, uh, new cases is going to rise uh, within, uh, if, if we see the last decade, there is a huge increase in uh, number of infection in key population. Yes, so for that purpose, uh, ministry should have a, uh, I, I, I am confident that ministry is on it and uh, uh, we are, uh, I mean, the ministry is working on it and how to tackle this problem and uh, uh, we we need definitely we need the, uh, the support from our partners and uh, uh, global fund unaids and uh, uh, unicef and other partners they they all are on board and uh, we all are working together uh, on these issues so the main problem is already uh, a few panelists have mentioned about the testing and treating so the testing and treating government is on it and we are well aware of it uh, recently, uh, we are going to establish three more new treatment centers uh, in federal area, Gilgit, uh, GB, and AJK. So these three uh, different uh, new centers is also going to be uh, started very soon. So uh, that will definitely tackle um, uh, more key population for to get a proper treatment in these centers. In addition to that, uh, we are also facing a problem of uh, coordination. We have a lot of issues regarding uh, coordination after decentralization. As uh, Dr. Umer also mentioned about uh, the, the, the uh, I mean, data sharing from Punjab province is again a big challenge for us. And uh, uh, as just I have to add one thing that I have newly joined, just uh, two uh, weeks before, 
so during this period, uh, we have also interacted with uh, provincial management, and I am confident that we will get uh, uh, the provincial uh, health department from Punjab as well, and we will be, uh, inshallah, we will be able to get uh, data from them very soon. Uh, so this is your probably second question about uh, the data uh, sharing. Yes, uh, we, uh, National AIDS Control Program, this is our mandate. Uh, Though we are not uh, a PR nowadays, but uh, we are SR with UNDP, but in spite of that, we have a national mandate and uh, this data uh, sharing and data management, monitoring evolution, and uh, you know, uh, just to uh, provide the treatment and testing across the country is mostly our responsibility as an NSCP under the ministry, under the umbrella of Ministry of Health. So uh, yes, uh, we, um, I mean, uh, recently we have a very uh, good uh, MIS system and we are kept, uh, capturing the data all over the country uh, except Punjab, but we are working on it. So uh, soon we will be able to get uh, data from Punjab as well. So uh, uh, we are also, uh, uh, we, we, we have a surveillance, a strong surveillance mechanism as well. And we are uh, also working on it. Yes, uh, one of the speakers, Dr. Faisal, also mentioned about the training. You know, the training is, you know, main component. And uh, Dr. Umair is also mentioned about the stigma. Recently, last week, we had a session in uh, federal uh, government hospitals where uh, Dr. Umar, uh, Dr. Umair has conducted uh, a session for healthcare workers for to, to, to control and to manage the, the stigma. Uh, you know, there are a lot of this is the main reason for uh, for their uh, last to follow up among the HIV patient. So uh, we have to give you know more trainings all over the country, and I would request our partners to help uh, uh, NSCP and help uh, provinces provinces to you know uh, uh, to, to to get on board to uh, give to uh, train more uh, doctors in this uh, area. Uh, so these are, I mean, these are the main responses from uh, your question. If you have more questions, then I can add uh, uh, on it. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kumar. Uh, I think you bring the very important point about training, especially for the ART center staff and all the counseling that is needed. Um, and so there, I think one vision will be to take each ART center and you know, provide them with targeted uh, training. Uh, that's a great point. And since you've just started two weeks ago, um, first of all, welcome. And um, um, I think this is a good session to just, um, although you seem to be aware of the data issues and um, I hope that um, the information um, uh, system, MIS system that you said, especially um, in the setting of COVID, uh, really works for HIV as well. I think Hina wants to say something, did you? Um, I just want to add something uh, to what uh, Dr. Kumar has mentioned. Considering the gravity of the situation, training of ART staff would be insufficient. You need to go down to the ground level, i.e. involve the family physicians. I don't think we can win this game without including a community-based physician. And that's, that's crucial. And I think it's, it's important we understand this sooner rather than later. So my special request to Dr. Ramesh Kumar, please. Thank you. And if I may intervene really quickly for a second, I also completely agree with that because when we talk about HIV, generally, a lot of focus goes on to the treatment and care of HIV patients. But we need to remember that the first 90 or the first 95 is as important as the treatment and care of HIV patients. So till we actually don't know how many people actually have HIV and then bring them to treatment and care, we are only doing half of the work that needs to be done. Dr. Kumar, would you like to respond to Dr. Hina's comment? Yes, uh, Dr. Hina, thank you very much for uh, the, you know the question, and you have rightly pointed out, and I have forget to mention this important thing as well. 
yes, to integrate uh, HIV, uh, you know, program with primary health care in Pakistan, this is, you know, our, ag our agenda nowadays. And even ministry is also working on it, uh, especially for universal health coverage and DCP3 uh, package. We are also trying to integrate this, you know, HIV program uh, with uh, PHC. So this is, this is yes, uh, we are much aware and we are working on it. And uh, very soon we will uh, try to, you know, integrate uh, this HIV with our uh, uh, lady health worker program, national program, and even at grassroots level uh, uh, at the basic health unit. So yes, uh, I mean, this uh, may bring a lot of, you know, uh, changes if we will be success to get uh, this program. Uh, sir, with all due respect, you will not be able to achieve universal health coverage without recognizing uh, family physicians within the private uh, public sector, within the public sector institute. Yes, 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 yes. Let me let let me respond to your uh, query. Yes, uh, you are, you know, family physician is uh, a backbone of health system uh, in every, you know, uh, the, I mean, developing or developed country, whatever uh, the, uh, we can talk. Uh, everywhere in the health system, the family physician are, you know, pillar of the health system. Yes, uh, uh, I'm, I'm working in Health Services Academy as a professor in public health. And recently we have also started this family physician uh, and we are also going to train uh, family, uh, uh, the doctors in family uh, medicine as well. And uh, this is, you know, main area where uh, we have to uh, involve uh, and we have to train uh, GPs all over the country in Pakistan. So we are working on it in uh, other aspect as well. And WHO, uh, with the support of WHO and Ministry of Health and Health Services Academy, we are working on it. And uh, definitely, uh, 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 we, we, we will try to uh, integrate uh, this program and uh, we will try to involve uh, GPs uh, who are working at uh, local community level, especially in rural areas. So yes, and, and second thing, uh, just I have to add uh, one more thing. Uh, last week, I met with uh, uh, some officials in, uh, in ministry where uh, we are also, you know, uh, trying to uh, include this uh, HIV clinics uh, with uh, ID clinics uh, all over the country. So, I mean, we are, I mean, this is, this is our idea. So in future, we will try to uh, integrate uh, uh, these HIV clinics with uh, TB clinics, infected disease clinics, and something like that. If you are talking about family medicine or family physician. So this is again uh, uh, on the higher agenda of ministry as well. Over to you. Uh, so if family physician ko treat kar dein, to three family physician per 10,000 population aapko achievement, ye sare vertical programs maha pe merge kar jayenge. You cannot provide a specialist for every condition in the peripheral areas to the marginalized population. However, what is doable is you treat a family physician considering the burden of the diseases. You have all the stats, you have all the evidences. You've said family medicine is the backbone. It actually does need the backing of the government, which is lacking. Uh, yes, you are right. But uh, recently, as I already mentioned, that government is uh, you know, working on it. And uh, uh, we are trying to you know, involve all GPs and we are trying to uh, train more GPs uh, in this program. So uh, we have started this program in 2020 uh, in Health Services Academy and provinces, uh, they are also trying to, you know, uh, start uh, their own program in each province. So yes, you are rightly pointed out this issue and uh, uh, we will try to integrate and we will try to uh, you know, train uh, these family physician at grassroots level, that will bring a lot of changes in the system as well. Over to uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ramesh, can we add something? Yes, 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 Dr. Khan. 
I think what we can do it, Dr. Nishma is already online. She can also uh, have her own opinion. She, I, I, I think we can give her the opportunity on the family physician or the general practitioner involvement. But we would also suggest that um, uh, um, Dr. Nishma, me, you and Hina Javed, we can sit some time uh, together and let's find the way how to involve the general physician, how, how to make a, um, a further programming for it. No, however, the Nishme will be discussing this more in detail. Dr. Thank Mar, you. Comment? Dr. Thank Mar. you so much. Yes, Dr. Omer, you want to say something? I have a very small comment. Um, the discussion is very academic and very practical. Uh, what I have seen, the success story in Pakistan recently is COVID testing. Uh, whenever uh, any overseas Pakistanis from any airline, uh, it's either a rapid testing, a private Chukhtai lab, or Aya Khan, a public sector. Anybody is testing in Pakistan, the dashboard of NCOC will depict the condition and the government can decide about the fate, lockdown and vacations. What missing in HIV is that people are test, getting tested in private blood banks, public blood banks, private labs, public hospitals, GP clinics, it's rapid test and field. We are only capturing data which our testing is done at HIV clinic or our CBUs or our NZ, the Nizindagi. We are not getting any data from anywhere. My suggestion is to Madam Noshin is here and we can discuss with Dr. Professor Sultan that our MIS is very robust, very good. We only want the private sector or the other people or partners who are doing any sort of HIV testing to share with us, we can reconfirm them, we can link the patient to the treatment, we can test the spouse and wives and their kids. So this is my humble suggestion. Thank you. Uh, the, thank you, Dr. Rumer. I think one of the very important that we need a, a integrated, harmonized MI system where all the private sector are supposed to be reporting. And I think one of the big challenges that Dr. Ramesh to take is to have integrated, harmonized MI system of the HIV response in the country. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayor. That was a very important point. Um, and I think I see a comment from Dr. Somya Iktadar, and she mentions that um, they have, uh, they're planning to start a training session for physicians um, uh, through the Pakistan Society of Internal Medicine. Uh, so, uh, and Somya and Hina have been uh, with us from the beginning. So I think uh, these are very, this is the grassroot training, which I completely uh, agree with this point and appreciate um, everyone, including our general practitioners for pitching in. I think we need to take these questions to our next speaker, Dr. Nashmia uh, Mahmood. She is a Fulbright scholar, medical doctor, and a public health specialist. She's currently working with UNDP as the national program specialist. And UNDP is now the primary recipient for the global funding. Um, so Dr. Nashmia Mahmood, what is your vision to change this deadly trajectory that this HIV epidemic is on, and are we on track to achieve the 95, 95, 95 targets? And um, now that UNDP is a primary recipient, um, how do you propose to address these issues that have come up, especially in this discussion, and the unmet needs of the people uh, living with HIV? Thank you very much. I was waiting for my turn to respond to the GP and family physician question as well. I think much has been said and, and thank you for a very good presentation. And it's a very good forum where we can actually discuss and uh, talk with uh, APNA doctors as well. So I'm happy to be here. Yes, as part of UNDP, uh, <clears throat> I would like to share that we have a component on uh, just on the last uh, point, because everybody was discussing. So we have a component where we will be engaging GPs and training the ART uh, center staff and uh, engagement of family physicians and general practitioners is the key uh, towards the achievement of these uh, 95, 95, 95 goals. And uh, looking at a holistic uh, point, and since UNDP is the principal recipient of the grant, we have this huge task in front of us and we are definitely delayed uh, to uh, meet the targets. And there has been discussion on these strategies and also the accountability mechanism. I think we have everything in place. We have the much effort was done into 2019 to develop these 
national and the provincial strategies which are aligned uh, with the international uh, guidelines for HIV. And then it was a big exercise which was conducted all across the country with multiple partners and multiple stakeholders, taking everybody's uh, everybody on board. And a lot of consultative meetings were held. And based on that, we also tried to incorporate the guiding, uh, the guidance from those strategies into the funding uh, request. And I happen to be the national consultant for this Global Fund Grant uh, proposal development as well. So I know that a lot of efforts has have been uh, done collectively from all partners from public as well as the private sector. However, I think the main gap uh, at our country level comes at the implementation. We know what to do. We know how it should be done. However, when we come to the actual practical implementation of those strategies, those guiding documents, even I would say uh, many trainings have also been done. A lot of capacity development exercises have been conducted. I have been engaged with this uh, epidemic for the past 20 years. And I know in the last two decades, many initiatives have been undertaken. However, when we come to the actual uh, interest for the beneficiary and and the final treatment or the final um, outcome, I would say, that's where we are compromised. We conducted this ART outcome study, and it's very sad to see that one third of the people who are actually detected, diagnosed, tested, positive, linked to the treatment centers, we lose one third. So that's such a low hanging fruit that you lose, that you, know, you, you lose those patients who are positive, you've been started on the treatment. And because of the stigma and discrimination and other issues as well, the treatment adherence uh, issues as well, and uh, psychological, and uh, there are there are multiple issues. However, stigma and discrimination came out really, uh, really uh, significant from there, and we lose those patients. So I think uh, we really need to um, uh, roll up our sleeves and move towards achievement of these uh, targets. Thank you. Please unmute yourself. Can I just make one comment in addition sure, to Hannah. the lady who's just spoken? Okay. Unless and until you make people accountable, implementation may not be able Training is out. You have used resource, what is its utilization? Are we wasting the resource here? So the training on its own, uh, in the chat box, there are also messages that training offer kar rahe hai. Fair enough. But you have to hold people accountable. We check cross check hai yaha pe. Are, are we are we missing that link you're so very right that's what i'm saying ke jab aapki implementation ki baat aati hai, when you actually come to see the doctor patient relationship or the actual uh, benefit to the patients and the people similarly aap agar, if you look at the key population and you see your outreach uh, there you have to do it through those communities and you have to reach those communities through their networks. So there are many gaps when we are trying to reach them and there are many gaps where we're trying to uh, work through the CBOs. So that part also has to be strengthened. One component is to the, our healthcare providers and then another uh, component is to reach to the communities through these uh, community-based organizations. So, so you're right, we have a lot of issues and the main issue and challenge is with the implementation and accountability. Yeah. Thank you. Is, is there Dr. Um, Mahmood, I, I'm, I'm not there, but uh, just is there any like a neutral um, monitoring of any sort? I mean, who, the thing is, there's a little bit frustration as to who is actually taking ownership and responsibility, you know, with their, definitely a lot of policies, but um, who is performing that role of yeah. accountability? Uh, we have CCM, we have the uh, country coordinating mechanism and they're they all the uh, government, UN partners and the um, donor organizations, the association of people living with HIV. They sit on that board and they uh, sit on that uh, coordinating mechanism and they have their quarterly meetings. They also go in the field. They also go to the ART centers 
and to the CBOs to actually see uh, the work that is being uh, done on the ground. So uh, but that mechanism is there and they're quite uh, strong uh, in Pakistan. And then we have the uh, missions coming in and uh, the Global Fund mission also uh, coming in to see the um, services. So it's not that the accountability mechanism is not there, uh, but yes, a lot uh, is also needed to be done. But that mechanism is quite um, comprehensive. It includes all the uh, significant partners and also the people who are suffering from the disease. So if you attend one of those uh, meetings, even the community members are there, people who are suffering from the disease, from the three diseases, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. So not only the organizations and the key partners are there, the actual patients are also sitting on the table and questioning you. Okay, well, we would love to have the CTM uh, uh, to our conversation and bring them here as well. Um, I just want to make a request. Please, all panelists, stay with us. We will try to finish this very soon, but please stay with us. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. I think I'm going to move on to Dr. Bushra Jamil. Um, she is the president of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Disease Society of Pakistan and is a professor and consultant infectious diseases at Al Khan University. And um, thank you, Bushra, from being here from day one. And Alhamdulillah, we are at the end of the final webinar, which has been, uh, thanks for your help on that. So, uh, you know, the main question of infection control policies, and there's so many, uh, you know, issues that came up, so feel free to respond to those. But especially with infection control policies, especially with the iatrogenic shift in transmission, what is being done for that? And, um, and go ahead, thanks. So thank you very much. This has been a very useful session and much needed one because we need to have this open dialogue with all the stakeholders and everyone who's contributing to HIV control in Pakistan. So regarding infection prevention and control. So uh, after the Ratodero outbreak, the world kind of descended on Pakistan and they took over the control. So people came in, teams came in, they took charge, took the entire responsibility of training people on ground, spent a few months here and then wrapped up and went away. Uh, the result as expected was, there was no impact on what was happening on the ground. So the practices remained the same because whatever the activities which took place I think they were not internalized and they were considered as something foreign, which was just being slapped on people who were there on the ground and they, they did not adopt them. So the ground situation has actually not changed despite many people coming in, spending a lot of money, making a lot of noise, making the problem visible, but no solution. The problem is still there. And Global Fund actually is cognizant of the fact that the situation has not improved and is quite worried. So when this opportunity came for COVID-19 mitigation funding, we actually purposely included infection prevention and control strategies within the grant because that was an additional fund and nobody had asked for it in the HIV grant, which is very sad. So we developed a separate component for infection prevention and control to be uh, implemented in the HIV hotspots in the country, because this is our opportunity to actually do some work in places where we know that HIV is an issue and the number of cases are increasing. Despite everyone being aware that these are the places problematic area, nothing concrete has happened on ground. So one strategy is implementing good infection prevention practices, uh, providing them with means of appropriate waste disposal. So this is all built in and that has been approved through our C19 uh, mitigation grant response mechanism funding, which Pakistan has received. So we have the funds now, uh, the next step is implementation and then monitoring. So, the first step has been taken, we have the funds, 
we know the problem we have the funds we have the strategy now it has to be implemented and i think uh, i'm actually quite grateful to global fund because i think the problem has been what i've seen is that there has been no academic dialogue even with the global fund so the people who understand the problems on the ground don't get the chance to talk to the funding agencies that is one major issue and uh, this time round we had long discussions with global fund and uh, we got a total funding of 90 million us dollars which includes the uh, infection prevention and control practices and we've got uh, whole genome sequencing funded as well so we have focused on strengthening health systems digitalization ipc and so on so and then linking sehat sahulat Uh, with marginalized populations so just taking small steps getting funding whatever the source which which is available easily so and this apna activity is a very important platform because this is the first time we've had the opportunity to sit together bring in people from different funding agencies from implementers policy makers and uh, this is a good opportunity to actually talk about the real issues and come up with strategies which can be funded and implemented and monitored thank you very much bushra and i think that your point of academic dialogue and that lack of that can be very isolating for any physician who is treating hiv uh, you know if you don't have that constant engagement so i think we are happy that at least we this platform is definitely um inviting engagement uh, one question i it was kind of new for me is this concept of ccm i'm not sure if we have missed them in our conversation or can you tell me a little bit about that yes a uh, ccm is a committee sort of a committee country coordinating mechanism so you have members from a uh, civil society from donor agencies from community based organizations uh, they all come together and whenever uh, there is an uh, there is an application for a grant uh, you have to present it to the entire group and get their feedback and endorsement so whatever the grant is approved by global fund it has to be endorsed by ccm members so you have this groups of individuals from different backgrounds so some are subject experts some are just members members of civil society lawyers cbo members etc you are mute sorry is dr rajwal khan part of the ccm yes he is okay. yes you are it is part of the ccm okay dr khan uh, please go ahead tell us uh, these gaps in um... no uh, b- b- main the the ccm is the uh, body that regulate or um, uh, coordinate all the activities of the global fund as dr bushra has very rightly said that all the proposal or all the fundings that are supposed to be approved by the global fund are to be endorsed by the ccm members the ccm have 50 uh, members from the government and 50% are from the private sector in the 50% of the private sector the un is the dfi he said here the permanent men, members from the development partners and who is also a member these four are from the private sector uh, the prs are um, uh, co opted members and the other association for people living with hiv is represented the community one the transgender community and one is from the malaria and the tb uh, uh, disease uh, representatives are available the civil society a few civil societies are also member of that committee unfortunately what the decisions are made over there dr bushra has have been witnessed uh, that the government representative are usually um, uh, not available or either least uh, interested to attend for example in my whole uh, seven years experience i have ne- rarely seen the member of the uh, uh, human rights ministry rarely seen the member from the planning commission no like this no then definitely the um, um, decisions are made by uh, uh, in the interest of someone else 
So what is the, we need some hope, uh, Dr. Khan. What is the next, how can we uh, work with those no, who do? Mm -hmm. No, I think what in my, uh, Dr. Nishmiya has already pointed out, I think we have to look into the organization of the CCM also, uh, depending on uh, what criteria is set. But however, in the next meeting, uh, I think we can take up this matter that we have to restructure or reorganize the CCM uh, membership, uh, how to make it more effective. Okay, that is, uh, that is great. I, we really wish you all the best with that. Yeah. Yeah, and this is yeah. a big jihad, uh, Dr. Khan. <laughs> so we are here to support and the basic yeah the basic challenge is that i think we don't have any such problem with the resources uh, because the provincial pc ones are um, um, uh, uh, appropriately or self sufficient um, uh, with the resources and the um, uh, more than 3000 um, uh, million has been allocated in punjab 50 million in khyber uh, pakhtunkhwa now, for example, uh, 50 million in Baluchistan, more than 246 million in uh, Sin for this one financial year. Now, I think we have a lot of resources, but the only thing is that um, the coordination among the uh, provinces and the federal level, and then the uh, real implementation issue, which my colleague, Dr. Nishma has already pointed out. Now, the strategies are there, the good practices, international practices are there. But the implementation is a real issue in. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Bushra has also uh, um, uh, men in West. Uh, uh, I think uh, you're breaking up. Results. Uh, at least Namit um, is leaving and uh, thing is that the community led responses are strengthening with every single day okay very much and we truly appreciate your comments your suggestions and your true hard work um, so thank you so much um, i think we have uh, one other speaker a panelist from Dr. Nahid Usmani she is the immediate past president of apna and a founding member of the merit program, and uh, we would like to hear some comments from her. Welcome, uh, Dr. Smani. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abbas, Dr. Fiza Gilani, uh, Dr. Hamad Ali, and all the worthy panelists on this uh, forum. I have found today's session to be so educational in the and so encouraging that all of you are frankly talking about the challenges, the issues uh, confronting the HIV community in Pakistan and are strategizing how, what are the next best steps and what are the challenges and how can we address them? And I think it's all a matter of conversation amongst yourself uh, where Dr. Hina Javed is concerned uh, Apna Merit started the Family Medicine Initiative, looking at the gaps in primary care across Pakistan, recognizing that it is one of the pillars of, uh, it is the main pillar, actually, of uh, medicine uh, in any country. And uh, this year-long session, educational and awareness session, organized by the HIV committee of APNA highlights that it crosses, uh, you know, the primary care, the specialty care, and has impact at so many different levels. Uh, even in US, we are struggling with lack of psychosocial support for our complex patients. And we realize that we have to have an interdisciplinary, a multidisciplinary approach to managing these complicated patients. And having a social worker and a psychologist is key to uh, you know, having uh, 
follow up and uh, you know take away the stigma stigmatization and have develop a collegial and a collaborative relationship with the patient and the family. I got sucked in in HIV because I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist being a pediatrician when I heard about these cases in Sindh in pediatrics it was very heart rending that children were contracting it even though they are not historically uh, you know the typical patients who come down with HIV and with the primary care we also have to include pediatricians etc in education and it is important that it becomes a nationwide uh, you know effort to eliminate HIV or at least get everybody treated uh, for this very uh, treatable disease at this stage and nobody dies of HIV nowadays except in Pakistan. So we need to make sure that those treatments are available in Pakistan. I thank Dr. Fiza Gilani for inviting me. I hope this conversation will continue. Uh, thank you so much. Over to Hamad uh, and Fiza. Do we have any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Naid Aswani. And I will really thank you to recognize this platform like 15, 20 years ago. Dr. Naid Asmani is the founder of this merit program. And your um, vision for this platform, I think is you must be very proud of this today. You created this platform for all of us. Thank you. No, I'm very proud of being associated with all of you. I think that this talent is your we तो एक प्लेटफॉर्म अपना ने प्रोवाइड किया है लेकिन काम करने वाले तो आप सब हैं और ये सारा शुक्रिया आप पे जाता है सारा क्रेडिट आप लोगों को जाता है कि यू टेकिंग इट टू द नेक्स्ट स्टेप एंड आई होप इट डजंट स्टॉप विद जस्ट दिस एंड ऑफ द ईयर दैट वी कंटिन्यू द एचआईवी वर्क इट्स अ नॉन गोइंग डायलॉग इज व्हाट आई एम लेफ्ट विद विद दिस फाइनल सेशन कि वी हैव मेड अ लॉट ऑफ प्रोग्रेस दैट वी हैव ऑल द प्लेयर्स टुगेदर talking about the disease and the challenges. So there's free communication, but then what we are going to do with those challenges, that has to be an ongoing dialogue. And I think one little step at a time, it, we're going to make a change. Yes, thank you. And that is our actually next year's project, which relates to all of these points raised by our uh, great panel today. And we will continue. Thank you. And, and that's precisely what I wanted to say at this stage that just um, that this is not our final webinar. This is just our final webinar for the year. And this will obviously the efforts will continue, um, not just throughout next year, but in the future. And I did want to invite all our panelists that are on our call today for a session probably within six months or 12 months from today just to come back and we so just so we can keep the conversation going. And this is hopefully not going to be the only session where you all get to participate and provide feedback and discuss different um, strengths, weaknesses, challenges, solutions. Um, but we will certainly ensure that there are further sessions in the future as well, where we actually continue to have this dialogue. I think Fawzia wants to say something. Yes, Fawzia. Yes, yeah, alaikum. Um, thank you. It has been a great session today, and I really appreciate all the speakers. Um, I had one comment and one question uh, for Ms. Mahmood, Nashmiya Mahmood. Um, so, I mean, really at this time, there is a lot of data coming in resource re um, rich settings like you, United States, that HIV testing and continuation of their care went down during the pandemic, um, um, especially. Um, uh, you know, in um, vulnerable populations. Um, I can't even imagine like uh, how things are in, um, you know, um, resource challenge settings like in Pakistan among these populations. And uh, definitely, you know, um, this is great that we are talking about uh, increasing HIV testing and upscaling it. Um, I wanted to ask you, has there been any discussion about um, funding for pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, especially um, uh, for the most vulnerable uh, key populations in Pakistan, because prevention is really the key 
Um, and uh, that would be great if we can start this discussion as well. Yes, thank you. I think that many efforts have been done in uh, PrEP and also post-exposure profile access. And we will be starting uh, this PrEP. We had this initial training on that and uh, rollout will be started uh, from the beginning of the year. And yes, COVID did had a toll uh, on the uh, you know people coming to the centers, people getting tested, and also for the treatment uh, time period. Initially, they were getting two months medication, and now because of COVID, uh, that duration has been extended. So um, we are trying to adjust with this new normal. And uh, but for prep rollout, we will be we have already started a lot of efforts, and the for, uh, the initiative will start from the quarter one of next year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ahmad. Um, so we do have a number of questions in our Q and A box. Um, we will maybe start with some of these questions. Not sure how much time we'll have to address all the questions, but I'll start from the top and request our panelists to participate in the Q&A session. So the first question that we have is, can public education about needle reuse at local and national level, um, is, it, is it being done and is it being supported by the parliament? Can I add? Uh, WHO has uh, worked a lot uh, on injection safety issues with ministry, uh, but uh, I think we need to involve Dr. Pasha, who is looking after this. I am not the part of that group, uh, but uh, substantial work has been, been done. And uh, uh, the exact situation, I, because I'm not the part of that group, um, if the group allows me to next, during the next meeting, we can invite Dr. Pasha who's looking after hepatitis and HIV in WHO Pakistan. Perhaps I can respond. Please. So, yeah. So again, WHO took lead in conducting sessions uh, for safe injection use, but there has been no impact of such training. And WHO actually accepts failure in this regard. And because of this reason, it was thought necessary to just discontinue reusable syringes. And for IV drug users, Dr. Uh, Mr. Salman was supposed to be here, but I've seen their program as well. So uh, they have a needle exchange program to ensure that the used needles are not used on other people and uh, to stem transmission of HIV from one IV drug user to another. So they have a well-established needle exchange program. And as far as government is concerned, uh, the, the reusable syringes will be will will not be available in in the next few months. So only self-destructing solo use syringes will be available. Great, thank you both. Um, just in interest of time, moving to the second question that we have, and that is around the outbreak, recent outbreak in Sindh, um, and the question is that. Don't we think that HIV is already in the general population and is the main issue regarding data and reporting considering that there was recently an, a major outbreak in the general population itself? Are you responding or should I? Uh, it's up to you. <laughs> I am just responding. Yeah, this Larkana outbreak, yes, it was really alarming. And uh, many efforts have been done in that regard. And uh, there are many pockets uh, and there are many outbreaks which are indicative of that spillover in the general population. And even having that concentrated epidemic in the key population and more than 5% is also a threat where it can actually spill over in the uh, general population. So we are also trying to have this uh, Larkana review, uh, which is going to be a joint initiative with UNAIDS and UNDP together with the government of Sindh to look, look into this and also uh, extend our services to go deep down uh, at that level and explore uh, what can be done uh, to mitigate those uh, things. But yes, we are very close to having that epidemic in general population. 
Can I add, Dr. Sam? Yes, sir. Please. I think uh, Dr. Nashmiya is right, but uh, there is another population which we called as the uh, bridging population. The wives of IDUs, they are, they are getting infection from their husbands, the partners of sex workers and transgenders. So we have the bridging population where we are not actually catering, we are not screening. We need to increase our testing, actually. And the other thing which I have already, uh, the COVID model, the, the testing in the field in, in various stakeholders need to be captured at central MIS. They are, because the testing is there, but we are not capturing that into the mainstream HIV data. Thank you. So just a comment. Uh, the bridging population is an expected group that HIV will spill over into bridging population. Our problem is much more serious than that. It has spilled over into general population, which are not part of the bridging population. And the mode of transmission is not sexual transmission. There may be more than one modes of transmission. And um, there is a lot of interest and activity to control whatever is perceived as the precipitating factor. Then uh, all the activities kind of just fizzle out. So this has been the pattern and Larkana is not the only place where the disease has spilled into general population. Um, the identified hotspots of HIV include, including uh, Jalalpur Jatta and Sargoda and other areas which have been identified, it has spilled over into general population. Yes, and I think uh, Doctor, if Dr. Faisal is here, maybe he can uh, comment on that as well. So my mood is here. So, so, so yeah, and, and I did want to comment on that, that, you know, apart from the known hotspots, um, I think one of Dr. Katie Usmani's talks really brought to light that there are also many unknown hotspots where in Balochistan now they're seeing a lot of general population um, uh, people coming in who are, um, who are not really true uh, sort of general, uh, sort of uh, key populations. Uh, and, and I think this is all really boils down to what we've been saying um, is, is Pakistan seems to be sort of a little slightly unique in, in the injection safety um, being one of the key risk factors here uh, beyond sexual and IDUs. One very small point, if you allow me. The program data which I have, the treatment is very interesting and it's not public yet. We have 31% uh, uh, PLHIVs on treatment who are IDUs. Only 1% uh, belongs to so-called the MSM, FSW, and transgenders. The rest are all, at least they claim, from general population. So, so program data is, uh, as Dr. Faisal said, that MSM and MSWs are not identifying them. But only IDUs and transgenders are identified. But it's the only 31% of IDUs which, are, which, which we are really confident they are key populations. So it, the program data shows us that it is going into a general population, yes. So I'm actually really glad that this conversation led into this direction because um, not just the three sort of hotspots that Bushra mentioned, there have been a number of other um, outbreaks reported, whether they were reported by the media and never really investigated further, or there were some investigations by either the government or by um, academic partners, there has been certainly over the last 10 years, at least, or probably a little bit more than that, um, number of outbreaks that have been reported in the general population across the country. And they, though some of this information has now been published in the literature as well. Um, so it's certainly the tip of the iceberg. If we are seeing these hotspots in different places across the country, then obviously there's a lot more going on that we haven't been able to investigate and, and obviously part of lack of um, testing in the general population is obviously a factor that should be taken into consideration. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly go to one more question. I, I know we are over an hour and a half, but maybe we'll just keep going for a little bit more. Um, the next question is, can televisits be provided where HIV clinics are not available, for example, in JFK and FATA areas? Should I respond? Sure. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, we have uh, the budget and we are planning very soon. Um, in fact, um, I'm planning next, within a month to visit AJK and GB, where we, the, the initial work has been done by Dr. Bushra and one in Islamabad. But yes, the teleclinic, the COVID has shown the beauty of the telemedicine. 
and uh, it is a part of this uh, global food proposal. I don't know what is the current, uh, Dr. Nashmiya can respond, but uh, the initial proposal uh, we suggest is to have a telemedicine clinic where, because one of the, uh, uh, the challenges that key population, they come to the clinic very late, 11 or 12, and our public hospitals, they work from eight to two. So the working hours for investigations is very difficult. So we suggested from 10 to five or 11 to five, with prolonged working hours. So I think this model should be a trial. And in COVID, we have a very successful model of telemedicine in Pakistan. Dr. I, I just wanna I just wanna add, sorry, uh, Umair, that Dr. Merke, uh, you know, I now since COVID have a number of my HIV patients who've actually moved to telemedicine and not to physical. Um, some of these are actually overseas. I have a few people from the Bay, uh, for example, who are living there and we consult on teleclinic and uh, they come in every six months. I have some people uh, who are up north. Uh, also, a number of people, because of stigma, again, uh, have for now preferred to move to telemedicine um, and are actually very happy uh, with the model. Thank you for your feedback, Dr. Faisal. Yes, I think uh, moving to this uh, uh, telemedicine would be helpful for the continuation of the patients. I'm not sure how helpful and how successful it will be for initial engagement of the uh, patient. So I think we have to keep that in mind uh, when we uh, model it. So, I mean, that is in our plan, but uh, the initial concept is to have it with the uh, Islamabad level and then continue with telemedicine. Dr. Romer, correct me if there's something else in that. Yeah, what we have, I think what I remember in the proposal was one model clinic in Islamabad, the, the, the physician will be based at APLHAV office, Yes. and then it will cater only the follow-up patients, you are right, not for initial, initial patients, because then you need baseline CD4 and a lot of labs, the gene expert, so, but for follow-up patients who are stable, their viral load is non detective they, they may continue on telemedicine, maybe Dr. Bushra can add. Yes, yes thank you. Uh, because we had uh, put in a proposal for the COVID mitigation grant and uh, actually it can be linked to the entire digitalization component which, which, which has been fully funded by the global fund. So th the objective was to offer teleconsultation to patients who have non-HIV problems as well. So if there is a medical issue, they're hypertensive or there is some other issue, they can uh, without actually coming to the center should have this option of consulting a physician, a family physician or a specialist. So that was the objective behind it. And secondly, again, because of uh, lockdowns due to COVID uh, to provide this option of consultation to HIV patients and again, follow up HIV patients, not the initial ones. So this can be linked to, to the digitalization strategy, but it depends on who will be implementing the digitalization component because it can be easily linked to teleconsultation. So one thing that Somia brought up that is probably going to be linked to the tele teleconsultations are um, for HIV patients is what about the availability of ART in the um, outside the government sector? So if we do have telemedicine available, then people will still need to go and collect their medicine somewhere. And if the medicines are once again only available at the ART center, then we are back to the same problem that we started off with that people still have to visit the ART center. So could, could you please talk about that? So definitely there needs to be a dialogue on implementation. At the moment, we are kind of created a wall around ourselves and we just insist on talking about ART centers. And that's not the way to handle the problem because it is highly stigmatizing. So there should be a dialogue between whosoever is looking after family medicine services, the universal health coverage, and linking these facilities with pharmacies, which can provide not just ART, but antituberculous medicines and other drugs which are provided free of cost to patients. And here comes the concept of one-stop shop. So you have one center providing services for multiple diseases. And um, we proposed this in the COVID mitigation grant as well. Uh, and uh, it all depends on who's, whoever uh, is going to implement it. The other way to do this is to do a DSD model, which we've also been working on, where uh, once somebody stabilized um, from 
wherever they get the care ART center, for example, they can for drug pickup, they just go to their local BHU or, or, or THQ, um, not an ART center um, uh, just for drug pickup because it's a lifelong med, uh, uh, sort of a, a, a disease and you don't want people to travel far away and they can just go to the local center just for drug pickup. And those people are then um, uh, obviously trained um, and these are obviously family physicians on, on uh, monitoring for any complications, et cetera, and then referring back only if required um, when they need to. So, so a DSD model also would work very well in this particular situation. I don't know about yeah, the I'm other DSD. Add to what you... Dr. Faisal has said, that will streamline the referral system between the primary care and the secondary care. Um, and they'll probably start talking to each other as well. Um, just out of curiosity, Bushra, Dr. Bushra Jamil mentioned WHO failed. Do we know why? Can we learn oh. from them? Oh, it was bound to fail because the teams came in, stayed for a short period of time, provided a kind of uh, training to master trainers and went away. And those master trainers were not actually the people who were on the ground. They were government servants, somebody's favorite, and so on. So, and uh, so coming back to what Busha and Faisal, you guys were saying, I think we have a number of models around one stop shop around DSD from other countries where this has been implemented for years and years by the, at this point, and there are successful models already available. Um, that can easily be adapted to the Pakistani local situation. Um, so conversation around these and, um, you know, available examples from around the world are, are very important to pursue. Um, and with that, I will move on to the next question because we have a lot of questions in, the, in, our, in our chat and in our Q&A box. Um, the next question is about the causes of the clusters that we've seen across the country in Pakistan. Um, and the question is, is it needle reuse by providers, barber shops, or lack of sterilization in dental offices, or any other issues related to primary care or IV drug use that are the leading cause of these clusters in the country. Dr. Faisal, or should I try? Can I? No, no, I can, I can, I can try, and then maybe you can help me out. Um, so, so, so between the three, um, a barber shop, uh, dentist, and a reuse of needles within um, within clinics, I think it's the last one, which is probably the the, the main issue. And it may not not always be reuse of needles, but it may also be just poor infection control practices. For example, um, often in these clinics, they have a big saline bag they will use one injection and just keep sort of reusing it. And if that gets contaminated, then every time they do a flush, they're going to sort of reintroduce HIV um, into it. So, um, so, and then now there are many reasons why this happens. Part of it is cost, part of this is training, uh, part of this is a lack of places where they can dispose. So, so there are a lot of um, reasons linked up to it. It's not just lack of knowledge uh, over here. Um, and that's why IPC is, is not just sort of education. There's a lot of system change, change that goes um, on with it. But Dr. Omer, maybe you can help me out now. Uh, what I have seen that uh, the, these, these epidemics or outbreaks, it is not only the injection safety issues. Uh, again and again, it's Larkana. And what I, because I, I'm working since, since 2008, there's a huge number of MSM and MSW population in Larkana and Dadu. And there are a lot of transgenders. You look at the numbers in both in Larkana and Karachi also. So it's very complex. It's not two plus two, four. It's a bit complex. And then these, uh, what I have seen in 2016, there's an epidemic after dialysis. And what I have noticed that these were chronic renal failure patients who have history of repeated blood transfusions. When I went to the blood banks, they were, the screening was pathetic. And these were political driven. So we were unable to stop those blood banks. And actually IDUs were selling the blood and the screening was inadequate. So it's a vicious cycle. So the whole health systems, you know, what we are seeing is the, the outbreaks or epidemics, uh, small. It's, it is just a reaction of some leakage. So uh, we need to revamp the whole health system. Maybe Dr. Ramesh can respond. I see that 
Um, we are well over our time, but I have, I'll just take two more questions from Q&A and thank you to all the panelists that have still stayed on the call with us. Um, these two questions are a little more charged, but I did want to actually get to these questions um, before we end the session. The first one is, how is the CMU going to manage the program if Punjab is not going to share their data? Can I or Dr. Ramesh? Uh, I've already planned and discussed uh, with the, the CMU uh, because uh, uh, um, the Dr. Ramesh is here and then his boss is a senior joint secretary. He has already talked to the program manager in Punjab who is a medical doctor with DMG background that Faisal Sultan, who is the federal minister and the Punjab minister, Dr. Yasmin Rashid, we will uh, arrange a webinar or virtual conference or we should go to Lahore. But we have tried it every level from last five years. I'm a bit frustrated, uh, uh, but it is a ground reality. We are not getting out of 50, 25 ART centers or clinics are in Punjab. And now after the UNDP arrangement, they are SR. So we don't have any power, anything to offer except the coordination. 18 amendment and this, so it is a chaos in health systems, but we are working and I'm hopeful inshallah, okay, we, we, we will be successful. What Nashmiya can add. I think she had to jump off the call. Um, Dr. Ramesh Kumar, are you, are you still there? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Omer is uh, very, uh, rightly uh, pointed out uh, and responded uh, the query. As I already mentioned that we are on it and uh, uh, hopefully we will get uh, done because we have involved higher management, even political leadership as well. So this problem will be resolved very soon. And the question is, you know, very relevant because uh, without getting the proper data at national level, we can't do anything. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is clear now, right? Absolutely. Um, thank you both. And the last question that I'll take from our q &A is about the fact that there has there is already drug resistant resistant HIV and drug resistant TB in Pakistan, um, don't you think it is a failure of the vertical program over decades? Um, and how is the huge funding by the global fund um, justified? And would there be any accountability um, for that? And I, and I know that's a very loaded question, but Dr. Bushra, Dr. Umair, Dr. Ramesh, we will actually look forward to you guys to answer that. I think Dr. Nashmi has left, like uh, she has to step down, yes. Sir. Yeah, I would like to respond to this one. Sure. So nobody has ever claimed that the programs are successful. A HIV program has been an abject failure. So, the sooner everyone accepts it, the better. You look at all the key performance indicators. So the figures which are submitted to the government are fabricated. So we are in a habit of fudging our figures, but the program, neither TB nor HIV uh, have been successful. So um, there is a system of audit and the global fund is actually quite worried uh, because uh, they are aware of the ground realities here. So they have put in a lot of checks and balances. And because of the poor performance of Pakistan in implementing uh, the grant here and the poor results and the way the things are, um, Global Fund has imposed additional safeguard policy on Pakistan which is actually uh, imposed on countries where uh, fraud is expected. So they are looking at us very, very closely. They're monitoring what the programs are doing. So there is accountability and um, so the funds are being monitored. Thank you for that. And um, Sama, back to you. I think we are well over our time that we had initially discussed. I think thank you so much and uh, everybody have a blessed rest of the week for the 2021 and uh, I hope we are COVID free by next uh, 
Yeah, inshallah. And looking forward to our next session in 2022. A very happy new year to everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for joining. Special thanks to Hamad and uh, Saima and Hina and Busha, Dr. Faisal, Dr. Omar, Dr. Ramesh, and everyone. And happy new year. And inshallah, we'll continue these talks next year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great.